Hi everyone. Now we've had a very quick look at the basics of copyright, we're going to start by thinking about times when you have to reuse someone else's work, and then we'll move on to talk about your own. So you might need to reuse other people's work in all sorts of contexts. Um, for instance, if you want to um, talk about somebody else's work at a presentation, you might want to include it in your own publications um, to critique it. You might want to distribute it with students and so on. So it is really important that you know, first of all, the things you can't do so you don't get into trouble. Um, technically, you can't make copies or distribute them if the work is under copyright. And most of the work you'll be thinking about will be because it will be uh, an intellectual effort from somebody that has been fixed or recorded either in writing or um, uh, visually and so on. So you couldn't, for instance, um, take an article that somebody else wrote and uh, put it on a departmental website for all your colleagues to see because you would have made a digital copy and then distributed that. You also can't adapt the work. So you couldn't, for instance, take uh, somebody else's data set in theory and change the graph around and reuse it in some other way. You can't perform the work, of course. Um, I know that might not be immediately obvious um, in an academic context, but think, for instance, of presentations and talks that you do, uh, the images you show, the text you share, the words you use. Um, if it's somebody else's copyrighted work, then you shouldn't um, be performing it. And lastly, because of those moral rights that were mentioned above, uh, you can't misattribute work. Obviously, you can't plagiarize or pretend it's yours or anybody else's. You also can't use someone's work in a way that is uh, detrimental to their reputation. Um, so you can't um, misquote somebody or um, try to deceive readers about the original intentions. Now, that all seems really restrictive. And you might be thinking by now, oh my God, all the things that I do are wrong. Well, not quite, because this is the general law, but there are lots of situations where actually it's okay to reuse work for various reasons. One reason is because the copyright has expired. So in the case of a book in the UK, that would be 70 years after the death of the author. Um, you might notice this, for instance, when suddenly loads of films about a particular book come out. If you trace it backwards, there's chances are that the copyright recently expired. Um, it's also why you can get lots of free audiobooks of really ancient works. Um, so it might be relevant in some cases, some disciplines, maybe less so in others. So let's talk about licenses briefly, because I will come back to licenses later on in this module. Um, but for now, let me mention the Copyright Licensing Agency license, uh, which the library holds. This is negotiated um, by a collective uh, in the UK, and it means that we have the right to um, reuse certain types of work um, for teaching and study purposes. Um, ask your librarians for advice, they know lots about these, but it's, for example, the reason why in the library, by the photocopier, you'll see signs that tell you how much you can photocopy, you know, one chapter of 10% of the book. Um, that's because that's what permitted within the CLA license. Um, there's also Creative Commons licenses. Again, I will come back to these, but essentially these are general licenses that a copyright holder can put on a work. And then anybody who finds that work is allowed to reuse it in certain ways specified by the license without having to pay anything, without having to ask uh, for specific permission. So look out for that logo. And lastly, there's something called fair dealing. Now, this is a bit of a gray area, and it's really difficult to give clear cut advice in this um, respect. Essentially, fair dealing allows you to reuse work in a fair way, but it isn't um, a very well defined um, type of uh, legislation. So, for instance, you can reuse it for purposes like uh, critique, which might be very relevant in academia, but also journalism, and private study, uh, but there are other conditions too. It can't be too much of a portion of a work. Um, and most importantly, it mustn't impinge on the rights of the copyright holder to make money from the work. So to put this into practice, say you are writing about a poem, it might be okay to cite a few lines of the poem if it's within the context of you critiquing it or reviewing it or comparing it to other works and, and then publishing your version of it. 
Uh, but it probably wouldn't be acceptable to copy the whole poem within an article that you're writing because then you'd be reusing the whole work and potentially people might not want to purchase a copy of the poem if they can get it from your work. Um, so as you can see, this needs to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. It's also worth bearing in mind that fair dealing is really just a defence in court. So it isn't something that can be um, decided beforehand whether it was fair or not. You would have to test it in court. You probably don't want to go that far. So I would keep fair dealing to um, as a last resort and seek advice if you think that you might need to resort to it. And so you might well find yourself in the position of having to ask copyright holders for permission to reuse their work. For example, because you want to include an image um, in the article, you want to um, use a graph in a presentation you're going to give and so on. And so you'll have to get in touch with them either by email or um, using automated publishers um, systems. Because by the way, remember, um, the copyright holder is not necessarily the author. In a lot of cases, when we look at journal articles in particular, the copyright holder is likely to be the publisher rather than the author. So try to find out who the copyright holder is and get in touch with them. You'll have to give them a full description of the material you want to use, how much of it, it's probably helpful if you can either attach a copy or give them a link so they can see exactly what you're talking about. And you need to describe in detail how it will be used. Um, why do you need that particular work? Uh, how much of it do you plan to include? And so on. Um, and I want to know the distribution channel. So is this going to be an article in a journal? Is it gonna be um, a presentation? And some things make a big difference. So. Is it a presentation to an audience of 20 at your departmental series? Or is it a presentation at a conference with 200 people, which will also be recorded and put online? That's likely to make a huge difference because the audience size increases exponentially. And do mention whether profit is expected. In a lot of cases, you might not be expected profit if this is for your research, but make sure you state that because it might make a difference. However, remember that they might still have um, to ask you for a fee. Uh, they still have the right to do that, even if you're not expecting a profit. Um, and then it's up to you. You can refuse to pay it and not use the work, or you can make arrangements to pay the fee. A few tips if you are finding yourself asking for permission. Most importantly, start early, particularly if you've got a deadline, like you want something published by a certain point, you need to graduate, whatever it might be. Um, Remember, this could take months because that take a while to respond. There might be a bit of negotiation back and forth. So as soon as you know you'll need permission, start early. Also keep records clearly of the conversation, uh, partly because if they do end up giving you permission, you'll need to keep that in writing and a safe place to be able to demonstrate it. Um, but also because in some cases, if after an extensive search, you have not been able to trace the copyright holder, then that work might count as something called an orphan work, which uh, means that slightly different rules apply and, um, and, and they might be slightly relaxed. So uh, seek advice if you can't find a copyright holder. And um, it might be appropriate to chase the copyright holder if they're not getting back to you uh, once, maybe twice. It's bad form to um, chase them constantly. They do have a right not to get back to you if they're not interested. And of course, that does not mean they've given permission. It's no good saying in an email, um, if you don't reply, I will assume you've given me permission. That doesn't stand. Um, if they don't reply, then assume you don't have permission and find an alternative. There is um, a particular case when it comes to thesis at Cambridge. Uh, so I want to delve into that, into that a bit more. Um, because as I've mentioned in a previous module, you will need to upload your thesis in Apollo in order to graduate. And in a lot of cases, that means the thesis becomes openly available online. So it's published as it were, and therefore you can't have um, third party copyright materials unlawfully there. So here's the process that you should be going through as you plan and write your thesis. First of all, identify what materials you want to use and check whether it's free to use. It's got a license, for example. If it is, make sure, and then that should be fine. You don't need to do anything else. If it's not free to reuse, then seek permission. As I said, start early, get in touch with the copyright holder, 
Now, they might grant it, they might request a fee um, or, or not, it's up to them. Make sure you're keeping records of those communications and then include um, the work. Make sure you state that that has been included with permission and the copyright belongs to that person. Um, if they don't get back to you or if they um, set too high a fee that you're not able to pay, they don't grant permission, then you have two options. One is to replace the content. Uh, say it was just an image that you had there because of its aesthetic value. It might be possible to find another. And there are, by the way, lots of sources of images under Creative Commons licenses. I'll include a link under this video um, to websites where you can find them. Really helpful for presentations as well. Um, if that's not possible, if it's a particular work and you need that one, then you might be able to redact it. So replace it with a white box um, and within the box, write something like content removed for copyright reasons and include ideally a link to the original content so that people can look it up. And um, now in some cases that just doesn't make sense. Um, take for instance, a history of art thesis with all the images redacted, it would be very easy to read. So if it's impossible to replace or redact all the third party um, content, then you might have to go for controlled access. That means that your thesis will not be available online, unfortunately, but because of that, um, it doesn't count as published, uh, and therefore there aren't these restrictions on using third party copyright uh, materials. The thesis will still be requestable, so there will be a page for it. People can um, automatically email the library and request it for their private study, uh, but they have to sign a weaver, which means it's not, um, it's not the same as publishing it. Now, I know this all sounds a little bit complicated if it's the first time you're looking at it. So the most important thing to remember is you are not alone. Now, us librarians are here to help you with advice. Um, librarians across disciplines are very well trained on copyright, so they should be your first port of call. There is a copyright help service at this email address here, copyright help at lib.cam.ac.uk. So any copyright queries, send them there, and there's a team of very well trained and knowledgeable librarians uh, who are looking forward to helping you. Right, so that's all for using uh, third party materials. Um, we're going to move on now to the next bit of the module, and I hope you can join us um, later on to talk about protecting your own work. Bye for now.